I want to welcome everybody um, to our session on women and hormones and with hormones and PD, the effect of hormones on, on PD. And um, we had a session several months ago where we had three, three women talk to us about their experiences, but now we have, we're coming from a different perspective. We have our, one woman who with young onset, and that's Caitlin, who actually was on TV talking about the, fat, the effect of hormones on, uh, on Parkinson's and her hormones. Roberta, uh, who does research, and Caitlin, who has also done research. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background on all of them. And as people are coming in, uh, you're going to keep hearing that dinging for a couple minutes, and then it should stop, I hope. So let me tell you a little bit about each of our speakers. Um, and I've lost that too. Okay. This has not been a good morning. Um, uh, this, okay. So Caitlin uh, Nagy was 31 years old when she first noticed a tremor in her hand. She spent seven years in denial, seeking alternative diagnoses and de delaying treatment. Um, along the way, she gave birth to a baby girl and ultimately came to terms with her Parkinson's. And um, she did not take Parkinson's medication while trying to, to conceive and throughout her preg pregnancy, which led to a very difficult experience. And through it all, she persevered. And now her daughter, Bridget, is a regular reminder that just like Parkinson's, while the journey is a challenge, the results are worth the effort. So now thriving as a mom and managing a creative agency, she wants others with young onset Parkinson's to know that they are not alone. Our um, second speaker is Roberta. Mar Roberta, I never know how to pronounce your last name. Marangio? How do you say it? Close enough. I've known Roberta for like seven years and I still don't know her last name. Um, she and her husband run the rock study. Well, it used to be rock study boxing. It's now stop PD program. That's in New York and Los Angeles. And we're waiting for that's it to go live again. Great. <laughs> but Roberta uh, obtained her PhD in neurogenetics and neuroscience from the Sap Sapienza university of Rome and the university of California, San Diego, where she studied the pink one gene responsible for the, an inherited form of Parkinsonism. Um, she is now at, well, she's a professor at Weill, Weill Cornell Medical College with research focused on gene therapy approaches for PD, and she also does Alzheimer's research. And our third, third speaker is Rochelle Flanagan, who is a registered dietitian and nutritionist, a mother of young onset PD, who is one of the founders of uh, women's, the women with Parkinson's project. I can't, is that the one? She's all over the place. That's all I can say. She's wonderful. She's a nutritionist and she's, and, uh, she's going to give us her, her take on all of this. So before I mess up anything else, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, Caitlin. And I think I have to let you, I'm going to make you a co-host because I don't know what I've done here. And now you can definitely share your screen. So go ahead, Caitlin. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me on this call, Sharon. And it's great to be here. Um, I am going to share a little bit about my story um, and also show you a commercial that I was in recently to raise more awareness around Parkinson's. I think the biggest focus for me is that I would love to be able to connect with um, women and men my age that are in, we're in the same boat as me, you know, that we're in denial, um, that are not ready to accept their diagnosis. I think that if I had had somebody to relate to my age seven years ago, I would be, I would have been in a much better space and wouldn't have had to go through all of these feelings and, and um, emotions alone. So that's, that's really important to me. I think we need to have more education around how it affects us. The other big piece for me, and I have really struggled with this from the beginning and having my doctor acknowledge or any doctor acknowledge the fact that my symptoms are solely, like I would say 90% related to my menstrual cycle. So, um, and I don't know if this is relative to anybody else, um, but feel free to raise your hand and say, Holly, yes, in the chat if it does. Um, but I would say that 
the week prior to my period, I start to experience the symptoms in hyper overdrive. So to the point of when I wasn't on medication, I was able to really, really pinpoint it because I would know that I would have about three weeks of manageable symptoms. And then the, you know, sorry, two weeks of manageable symptoms. The third week was, you know, it was just like taking four steps backwards. You know, it was hard to get dressed. I couldn't do my hair. Um, I couldn't chop food. I couldn't, I couldn't work. I couldn't type or write. I'm left-handed and it's mainly dominant in my left side. Uh, so it became super frustrating. And then to the point where on day 28, the day I was about to get my period, it would just, it would like, it still debilitates me to the point of needing to be like on the couch or lying down, not being able to do much that day because I'm so atrophied. I have so much dyspnea. I have so much dystonia in my hips, in my legs, in my arms. And then as if by magic, as soon as my cycle starts, it all goes away. And I will have a full week of like, huh, do I have Parkinson's? I don't know. I don't really think I do. Um, and then it'll slowly build up once I'm done ovulating. So I was of the mindset before I went on, on medication that if I had, if I was able to get pregnant, um, I would be okay because the symptoms were mainly focused around my, my period and not my ovulation moment. Um, so what was interesting is that that was not the case at all. Um, I went into, I, it felt like every day of my, my, my pregnancy was me experiencing the last week of my cycle over and over again. And as my, as I moved into the third trimester, it just became more and more difficult. Um, so that was really frustrating. And then I went through this whole wave of, okay, well, it's going to get better. It's going to get better after I give birth and I'm nursing, and this is gonna be great. Um, I did try that, I tried nursing for six weeks and it was, it was horrible to the point of every time I would actually breastfeed, um, as soon as I would breastfeed, I would get this huge surge of like um, weakness and stiffness where I couldn't lift my daughter up out, out of my arms or stand up. I would fall over, I'd have to, I couldn't walk across the room because my my limbs wouldn't move it felt like it felt like it took me a day half a day to get across the room you know it was so difficult so I stopped breastfeeding at six at six weeks and things started to get better like they started to level off um and I still had chosen not to take med medication uh six weeks later my first cycle started after I had been pregnant and I could feel when I was getting my period because I started to all of a sudden walk like me the walking was my walking when I was in postpartum was so bad like I was holding on to my daughter's stroller and moving really really slow and very hunched over and as, as soon as I could feel, I felt like cramping and I'm like oh what's going on and then all of a sudden I was walking really fast so I pushed and pushed my doctors to find out what that, that, you know, this has to be related to something. This is a huge key here. Like if I'm having these symptoms while these hormones are cycling through my body and when they're not present, I feel normal. It, there is something there for sure. Um, and the other, the other component of that was, it was, you know, I, I would, I think I had tried so many different alternative therapies and breast, you know, like different doctors and seeing different, you know, naturopaths and things like that. Um, I went to the point of pushing towards, you know, getting, I'm in the process of getting mold testing done to see if I have a susceptible to mold and that would have caused it. I'm trying out um, a Dutch hormone testing to see if that's, that's re related to it at all. So I'm still exploring those options and I'm looking at different ways in which I can find out more, but I would love to understand more about how my Parkinson's was triggered initially. And I think it has a lot to do with hormone imbalance and, and feminine cycles. And is it, you know, is that relative to environmental toxins? Is it relative to the food that we're ingesting? Is it relative to, um, 
post-traumatic childhood traumas like what what are the what are the relations to that because there's from what I understand there's a lot um, and the video I'm going to share with you is not so much around hormone relation but it's around um, my coming out story so I had not told any of my friends or family they knew I had the shake in my wrist and I had downplayed it for about seven years including my wedding and everything like that um, so I'm going to share with you a video that I chose to do as asked to participate in it with Parkinson's Canada to come out and share the fact that I had Parkinson's and I shared this video on my social networks when I came out and I was very scared to, to share with a lot of my friends, especially like friends that I have known for a long time or distant, mm -hmm. distant relationships because it was, it was really embarrassing and and I felt like ashamed that I was going through this, but whenever I think somebody else going through this in my position, I think about, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You're, you're going through this, but you're still living your life. That's so empowering and strong of you. So I, I really wanted to do this to create more empowerment for other people to feel like they could come forward and, and be okay with the fact that they had this disease and understand that there's life after being diagnosed and you can still function and do things. It, may take you a little longer it may take different kinds of medication but it's still doable and I think the more visibility we have around this the more we can create awareness to finding out what what the issue is behind it so I will share my screen Diagnosed. When I was diagnosed, when I was diagnosed, I felt sad, afraid, confused, angry, alone, stunned. When I was diagnosed, I felt like crying, and I did. Imagine you're told, so slowly you decline. You will find it hard to recall words. You'll begin to shake. This will never go away. Nothing prepares you for Parkinson's. Nothing. Nothing, but no matter what they say or how many times you're asked, what's wrong with you? What's taking so long? Why are you shaking? Can I just pour some water into something before you get started? Yeah. Life goes on. No matter what. 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 So I made a choice to make a difference. Because there is strength in numbers. There is hope in research. And there is support. All around me. My friends. My family. My life. My Parkinson's community. And there's acceptance. 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 The journey continues. I want you to know I will never give up. I will always be there. I couldn't do it alone. I'm going to say it loud and proud. Parkinson's matters. I'm here. I am here. I'm here. I am here. I'm here trying my best. And I won't give up. No matter what. <laughs> Okay, that's the video. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Oh, it was our pleasure. Thank you. Um, like you, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't come out in public either for like five years. And I had already started my blog. And one day I posted it on the wrong Facebook page, on my public Facebook page. And the world didn't crash down around me. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> then I, you know, but it took me that long so I, I understand where you're coming from. And I know that a lot of people have similar stories. So, okay, thank you. Um, Roberta, you're gonna have to unmute yourself and sure. I will put mm -hmm. you, where are you? Okay. I'm here. You're there. Okay, let me- Yes. <laughs> All right, I have to unpin. All right, I don't know what I'm doing here. Oh, okay. Here we go, remove pin. There you are. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to pin you however I can do this and. All right, well, go ahead, Roberta. I'm gonna okay, let you go sure. ahead and I'll figure out. Right now, you, I think you're the, uh, <laughs> I have speaker sure. view, so it's fine. 
Okay, I'm going to share my screen too uh, in uh, two seconds. Okay, so as Sharon yeah. said, um, I'm a scientist. I, I have two jobs, three. One job is I love my dogs. <laughs> that makes life so much better. <laughs> That's priority. Um, my second job, I'm a scientist. As Sharon said, I work in uh, New York City. Um, I do research on Parkinson. I've been doing this for, sorry, I have something in my eye, just one second. I've been doing this for over 15 years now. And, and um, recently started working on Alzheimer's too. And then I have a nonprofit organization with my husband called Stop PD, like Sharon said, where aside from like in my lab, I try to understand what are the causes of Parkinson's so we can develop treatment and hopefully a cure. But at the same time, with the organization, we try to uh, provide programs or help people on a daily basis until this cure will will come. And that's what that's what we do. Um, so I just prepare a few slides um, to give you an overview of what is the status of uh, hormones and Parkinson's at least from a research point of view, and a little bit about what I'm doing. So you get a sense of what happens in the lab, because maybe I feel sometimes there is a disconnect that there is not much information out there about what happens in the lab. It always feels like it takes 10 years just to try something and then you find out it fails. So unfortunately, that's the nature of how science goes. Um, but I just want to share with you a little bit of what I what I do, just to you know explain how how we work. Um, so let me share my screen. Here it is, and then I'm gonna go in presentation mode. Okay, so. Um, just you probably already know since you're attending today's event that there are differences between men and women when it comes with uh, Parkinson's symptoms. It's not just a matter of the prevalence um, where men are known to uh, have a higher prevalence and incidence of Parkinson's than women, but also, as Kelly said, um, symptoms can be affected. Uh, by hormones, for instance, or just by the fact of being a woman, uh, you can experience different symptoms than men experience. And one example is, uh, for instance, the fact that women experience more tremor type of um, motor symptoms. Uh, men usually tend to have more freezing of the gait or tend to be more hunched over. And then there are also differences in non-motor symptoms. Women may experience more pain, uh, more um, uh, mood disorders like depression and anxiety, whereas men may experience more um, cognitive um, issues. Um, I'm not gonna go over, you know, all these all these symptoms. I just wanna show you what is the status of everything that has been looked at so far, and how unfortunately sometimes can be a little bit confusing. So there are some, I put together all the studies that I found so far that have been published. They looked at um, this difference between men and women from an hormonal point of view. I did not look at, I'm not showing you the differences that could be related to genes or chromosomes. I'm just showing you differences that could be related to hormones, okay? So um, there are many studies that looked at association between the age of menopause, for instance, and Parkinson's risk. The way to look at this is on the left, you have all the studies and all the scientists that looked at this association. And then in, uh, in these bars, what you see is wherever the dot, it's on the left. So you have, a, you have a, this um, middle bar here, okay, this number one. Whenever the dot is on the left, that means that the, there is an opposite association, means that, um, that, that, um, that menopause, that having, that having, going through menopause reduces risk of Parkinson, okay? Whereas the, when the point is on the right, that means that 
going through menopause increases your risk. So as you can see, the dots are on the left and on the right, on the left and on the right, okay? So it's confusing. And the reason is some that, that some studies are done in specific countries. They don't look at population worldwide. So if you look at studies done in Italy, for instance, they show that the age of menopause um, increases your risk of Parkinson's. If you look at other studies in other countries, they show no effect. In other countries, like in China and so on, they show that there is a negative association. So it is really important, and it's one of my messages, that we look at what happens in the whole world because different countries may have uh, different, they may show different associations, just depending on, you know, how genetics also works and how hormones works. So this is one of the things I looked at for you. And then I put together another one, which is very similar. And this one looked at the correlation between the age in which a person may experience menopause and the age of PD onset. So in this case, instead, there are very few studies. In this case, all the dots are sitting on the right side. That means that the early the age of menopause, the early the onset of Parkinson. This is very, very few studies, but kind of striking. There is uh, not a single one of them that shows the opposite. So the earlier the menopause, the earlier the PD onset in people that are at risk, obviously. Um, and then the last one, which is a long, long list, it's the, um, these are all the studies that looked at the association between hormone replacement therapy and Parkinson's risk. They're all a lot because there are, mm, because the scientists found, the clinicians found many contradictory results. And the reason is, and keep this in mind when you read, you know, the newspapers or magazines or even new studies, keep always this in mind that when studies are designed sometimes, or at least in the past, the clinicians had no much choice in what kind of hormone replacement they went, no, let me take a step back. Not that they didn't have a choice. Like sometimes when, when a study is designed, it's designed specifically for a type of treatment. So it's really hard to find a study that looks at what happens when um, some people are given estrogen or other people are given a combination of estrogen and progesterone. Some other people get progesterone. So depending on what the, the therapy is, you may have a different effect on the Parkinson's risk and also on the Parkinson's symptoms if you already have Parkinson. So what this is showing is, again, if the dot like here is on the right side, that means that when you take hormone therapy, you have an increased risk of having Parkinson. If the dot is on the left, that means that if if you took or you're taking hormone therapy, you have a reduced risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So when I went through all these studies, what I noticed is that all the dots that are on the left are the ones where women were given estrogen therapy. Many of the ones that are on the right, that means that this type of hormone therapy increased the risk of Parkinson. Many of them had progesterone. Okay, so I'm not saying that this is the verdict. What I'm saying is this is what comes out of all the studies. So again, when you hear something new that coming out, keep that in mind. If, if they just mention general hormone therapy, you wanna know, but what was that? And then another thing that you wanna know is, is not just what was given because that can make a big difference. You wanna know the age of the women who took that type of hormone therapy. Because even when we talk about menopause, there is a big difference if the hormone replacement was taken during menopause transition, after, during post-menopause, they can make a big difference. In the Alzheimer's field, we found, for instance, that, please stop me anytime if you have questions, if I'm like saying anything that 
uh, it's confusing or it doesn't make sense. In the Alzheimer's field, they found, for instance, that when the hormone replacement therapy was given during the menopause transition on early years of past menopause, that hormone replacement therapy had a very beneficial effect on the Alzheimer's symptoms. But when this therapy was given 10 or 20 years after start of menopause, that either did not have any effect or even would make the symptoms worse. So it, it's not a really linear correlation between hormones are good or hormones are bad. It depends on the status of our brain, like what, what age it has our brain and what is the status of our brain? Is it a status where receiving hormones is receptive and can be beneficial? Or is it a status where um, receiving hormones is not a good thing at this point? And um, it's not a matter if the brain, like how the brain is working, it's more about what's happening. Because as we age, things change. And so the response to hormones can also change. So you want to keep that in mind. And I think that's why it's in so many years, all these studies, when you put them together, they may look a little bit confusing. But if you really go into details and you know, look at, is it estrogen, is it progesterone, or what age was given, or what status of menopause was given, then you can really start teasing apart what's happening. Okay, we and have one question for you, Roberta. Uh, sure, sure. Did the hormone therapy measure how long in years someone was on hormone therapy? So some do and some don't. It seems that um, to um, in women, there are at the early menopause or during transition, uh, early years of menopause, early stages, um, to have a beneficial effect, you need to be on hormones at least five to 10 years. There are a few studies that show that if you're on hormones for like one or two years, that is not enough to get a beneficial effect. But again, keep in mind that not all these studies tell you exactly what's in the formulation of the therapy. Some they just say hormones. And so you don't know. So wh wherever I found it, I wrote like ERT, this, this means estrogen replacement. HRT means hormone. That means that these people did not tell us what was given. Um, ERT plus PRT means estrogen and progesterone. So that means this study told us what was given. Mm -hmm. um, so not all the studies tell you exactly. So it, it's hard to interpret sometimes. Um, but it seems that um, at least uh, it seems that to have some benefits from the therapy, you need to be on for a few years at least. Okay. Um, okay. So not to take too much of your time, I'm going to move on and tell you what I'm doing. Okay. And now I'm trying to understand exactly what's happening in the brain. Um, I don't work with uh, people with Parkinson in uh, in a research environment. I uh, work on a, in a lab on a alpha synuclein. Yes, who said that? <laughs> okay. um, so I work with animals, and we're trying to model what can happen in a human brain using rodents. And because my expertise in gene therapy, so I I use um uh, viral it's whoever it is can you mute yourself please whoever's talking yeah um, um i'm using viral vectors that what can they can do they can deliver something to the brain so i can do a brain surgery and i can inject these viruses they are not toxic per se they just deliver something they're just used as a um um i don't just the just a, a tool to deliver alpha synuclein into the brain. So what I do, I inject alpha synuclein in the substantia nigra that I'm sure 99% of you know that, most of you know that substantia nigra is the part of the brain where the cells die, degenerate in Parkinson, and it's one of the main reasons why you experience motor symptoms. So by injecting alpha synuclein in the substantia nigra, I induce the generation of these cells. I'm trying to mimic what happens in a human brain when these cells die, okay? So I take these viruses, 
that have alpha alpha synuclein or something that has nothing to do with Parkinson that we call cherry, just because it's red. Um, and then I inject it in the mouse in the substantia nigra. Okay, so this creates a model of Parkinson's in the lab. And what I can show you is this. So here you're looking at the substantia nigra in the brain. Um, this red is my virus. Okay. And then these green are the cells in the substantia nigra. Um, so if you look carefully in the left, there are a lot of cells, many more than there are on the right. On the right here, you see there are no cells because I injected alpha synuclein and the cells died. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. This virus doesn't do anything to the brain. It's our so-called control. So the cells are all there. These virus kill the cells in the nigra because I'm injecting alpha synuclein. And when I look at what happens to the mice or their motor function, what I see is this, I'm just measuring how much they can walk. And then this is like over time, four months, five months, six months, eight months, the, the mice are aging. So the important thing to look at is the blue because the mice in the red bars over time, they're walking a lot just to measure how much they can walk. The ones with the blue, which are the ones that get synuclein, they cannot walk that much, um, which is a, um, a measure like freezing and some of the symptoms that you may be experiencing that we're trying to mimic in the lab. So okay. this is our model. And then what I do, I wanna know what menopause does. So I take these mice and I take males and females and in the females I induce menopause. And this is just a schematic of what I do. Males and females, here I induce menopause. Then I inject the AV, the virus, um, with synuclein to create a Parkinson's model. And then I let them go through menopause, through transition to menopause, and then through po post-menopause. And then I check what happens to their motor symptoms. So again, take males and females, induce menopause, induce Parkinson and then see what happens to their motor function and also what happens in the brain at the level of neurodegeneration and so on. So what we found so far is this, you take the males, this is our control virus and they're fine. This is the number of cells that we were looking at in the substantia nigra. When you inject synucleins, half of the cells die. Okay, so that's why this bar is lower. You take the females, this is the control virus, you inject synuclein, you can see how you don't have that many cells that die, as in males. There are many more cells here, okay? Then you take more females and you induce menopause and you have less cells when you have alpha synuclein in these females. Is that clear? Am I explaining that in a clear way? I don't know. Um, then we looked at their motor function. So bear with me here, okay? So the blue is the males, okay? And again, as I show you before, is over time. This is how the animals are aging. And we still measure how much they can walk. So as the males age and they develop more and more and more Parkinson, they can walk less and less. So the blue keeps going down. There is a decline. Then you take the green, which are the females. The females, even though they got synuclein, they can walk more. They don't have a decline over time like the males do, they are the blue. So there is a big, big difference between the blue, the males and the green, the females. They don't decline as much, they can walk a lot. But then when you induce menopause, which is the red, there is a dramatic decline in how much they can walk. And they actually walk as less as the males. Okay, so that's what menopause is doing. And now that we looked at how many cells there are in the substantia nigra, we know that there are fewer cells when you induce menopause. Now I'm gonna stop here. We're gonna look at what happens to alpha synuclein, what happened, is there brain inflammation? Like what is the mechanism that it's inducing this? 
that it's causing the females during menopause to walk less, to have more freezing and, and so on. Um, hey, Roberta, I'm sorry. We, we I'm going to leave it here because I'm taking oh, okay. too much of your time. Yes. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Sorry. I okay. was just trying to go slow because I didn't want to be, I want to make sure to, to be clear. Um, I'm going to stop. Okay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. It, we've got a lot of questions for you. So um, I think did I we'll stop wait. the sharing? Did yeah. I stop the sharing? Sharon? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah you did. Uh, we have a lot, a number of questions for you, but we're going to go ahead and have Rochelle give her talk, and then yes. we will. Um, Rochelle, I'm going to need you to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, yeah. Rochelle, for taking time off you. I apologize. Oh, you're sharing your screen again. Oh, I've got Rochelle's screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I got to unpin you. Oh. All right. And you. Okay, there you go. All right, you're on. Just got my, uh, <laughs> so I can see my presentation myself. Okay, so can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so hi everybody, yeah, um, and no worries, Roberta, it was really interesting. I <laughs> could have listened more. Um, so just, yeah, my name is Rochelle Flanagan. I was diagnosed, well, pick up my own Parkinson's, um, in my dietetic clinic when I was writing in a record card for a patient who hadn't been to see me for a while and noticed my handwriting was very small. And what was really weird is I couldn't make it bigger. So that's basically um, what uh, basically was my first symptom was micrographia. Um, and I was actually pregnant with my daughter at the time. Um, so I was uh, 46 at the time. So geriatric mom, but uh, anyway, um, I had to wait until she was uh, born and uh, finished breastfeeding before I could get a DAT scan to confirm the diagnosis. But uh, anyway, so that's why I'm, I'm here today. Um, since that diagnosis, I've got very involved with the advocacy um, as a founding member of the PD Avengers. And then more recently with two young onset friends in the States, uh, we've set up the Women's Parkinson's Project. Um, so basically, I'm just going to go through here a survey that we did that I put together um, asking women about the effect of hormones on their Parkinson's symptoms, because in a lot of the, um, you know, support groups, Facebook groups, you know, um, chats amongst ourselves, um, women with Parkinson's, we noticed that our hormones around our um, cycles definitely were um, worsened. Uh, and also women around, I'm sort of, you know, perimenopausal and I noticed fluctuations of symptoms when I went into the perimenopause as well. Um, so, we thought we'd, we'd survey and ask the women themselves because there really wasn't much in the, the literature. Um, so Roberta's already mentioned in terms of, you know, the difference between men and women in terms of our symptoms. I'm just showing you this little image here, um, basically was developed by a, a colleague with uh, young onset Parkinson's in the UK, Johnny Akinson, but uh, basically just highlighting that women in particular suffer um, from anxiety, depression, um, things like loss of smell, Etc. But also that our medication effectiveness, uh, you know, doesn't seem to work as well around menstruation. So I'm just going to give you go through the results of the survey. So we asked, we had uh, over 200 women. Um, we didn't ask what age they were. We just asked women in general. Um, so in terms of we asked them whether their symptoms uh, of Parkinson's worst around the menstrual period. And you'll see here, 74% said yes. Uh, in terms of what motor symptoms got worse, uh, the ones that got worse were the, the bradykinesia, the slowness, the rigidity, the tremor, and the dystonia in particular. And the rigidity was the one that stood out as the highest uh, in terms of the motor symptoms. In terms of non-motor symptoms, interestingly enough, a lot of them were in the mental health sphere. So in terms of anxiety, apathy, depression, but the highest was obviously fatigue. Uh, and then there was things like excessive sweating and uh, insomnia. We did a... Um, Hispanic survey as well. It was interesting, there was a slight difference in terms of the symptoms there. They didn't suffer from depression or anxiety as, as being the top. It was apathy, insomnia, pain, and fatigue. We're not too sure now. There's only a small, about 30 of the women were Hispanic, so it's a small subset, but nevertheless, there, it shows there may be differences uh, between different um, uh, nationalities as well. And then we asked whether when your symptoms uh, got worse, and uh, the majority, sort of 84%, said that their symptoms got worse the week before the period. Um, actually, 50% said their um, symptoms were worse 
to write their, their whole um, week of bleeding, not just before. And some women actually suffered in the week after their bleeding stopping as well. Um, in terms of perimenopause, then we asked women whether their flu symptoms fluctuated, their PD symptoms fluctuated randomly during peri perimenopause, and 64% yes. And in terms of, uh, we asked whether symptom control was difficult during perimenopause, and again, it's a similar answer, 64%. In terms of postmenopause uh, symptoms, we asked whether your symptoms got better or not. So in the, the whole group, basically um, about 60% said the same, and about just over 20% said uh, worse, and there was about 15% said better. In the Hispanic res results, um, you'll see here that actually there was a, a much higher percentage that said that they were worse. Not too sure why that is. Um, and then in terms of hormone replacement therapy, you asked people whether they had hormone replacement therapy, and 80% uh, said no, but 20% said yes. And you'll see in the Hispanic, it was a much lower percentage uh, of the Hispanic um, ladies who had HRT. And then the effect of HRT on their symptoms. Um, so just over 40% said that they felt better with the HRT, um, but uh, there was about the same, about 28% said it was the same or worse. Now, the, again, the numbers in, in terms of women on HRT were small in the sample. So we'd really need to do wider research on women with Parkinson's who've used HRT. Of those who did have HRT, uh, the majority took it during their perimenopause um, and about 24% took it after the menopause. Uh, we asked then, I think this is one of the most interesting uh, results, was basically whether your neurologist um, engaged with you around your hormone and the effects on your symptoms. So basically, 87% uh, of women responded that neurologists did not talk about the impact of hormone on their symptoms. Uh, over 90, near 98% didn't adjust medication around their cycles. Uh, and over 90% didn't suggest HRT. And over 90% of neurologists didn't talk about perimenopause or menopause effect on Parkinson's. So pretty astounding in terms of the lack of uh, engagement around neurologists with women, considering that many women, uh, and I think the survey shows how many women are actually struggling with their hormones. Um, and, and, and that's really one of the reasons why myself and uh, two of my co-founders are based in the States. Some of you might know them, Cat Hill and Sri Surapathy. Um, basically decided we need to do something about this and we need to raise the voices for women for better treatment and research for women uh, with Parkinson's disease. Um, so we kind of really feel that we need a gender specific approach just like Roberta is doing, which is amazing to see. Um, and I thank you for doing Parkinson's research for 15 years. Um, and hopefully it'll, it'll come to fruition um, that something will come out of it. But uh, in terms of we need gender specific approach, we need research to have a gender lens like Roberta is doing, uh, even in the lab setting um, and, you know, clinically. And we need us women to actually ask, you know, our uh, neurologists and anyone that we know that's doing research, are they looking at women as well as men? Are they looking at female rats as well as male rats? Because it's only by doing the lab work that they move on to clinical work. And if they don't test within, you know, female animals, then, you know, they're not going to get the answers right in the clinical setting. Um, we need to educate medics, healthcare and social professionals, partners and families around the real impact that um, that hormones have on, like we know as women, you know, that at least one week out of every month we're in, you know, big trouble. And for some women, it's a lot more than that. Uh, and then we have the Parkinson's symptoms on top of it. And the impact on women is much bigger because we tend to be carrying a larger load of either working you know, looking after family, looking after older parents, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on for women. So it really needs to be taken into account. Uh, we need to have the medics uh, ask women about their hormones and their symptoms and the, and the nurses, because often women are shy of actually mentioning this or feel like, oh, I don't want to bother anyone. It's just my, you know, hormones or they're told by their, their medics, you know, oh, it's just, you know, it's just your, your hormones. So we have to basically say, no, it's not just my hormones. There's something else going on. You know, my my symptoms are out of control, I need help. So we have to actually raise our voices as women to start the, the conversation. Um, I think as well, there needs to be, we feel that it needs to be standardized tracking of symptoms. So we need you know, some way, um, like when there are standardized in research, um, there's standardized tracking um, surveys for women with perimenopausal uh, symptoms. 
So I don't see why we can't do something similar in, in terms of women around their Parkinson's and uh, the hormones um, and maybe look at digital tracking and using video tracking and trying to kind of get a cohort of research that actually can can see what's going on. Um, and also, you know, we feel very strongly that women are suffering today, um, you know, and need to be treated today. Um, so in my own example, I asked my own uh, consultant, should I consider HRT? And he was like, oh, you know, there's high risk of stroke. And I was like, OK, so it kind of scared me. I went off. And thought, okay, maybe, maybe, I, you know, maybe it's to do with the Parkinson's that high risk of stroke. And then I realized, no, it's to do with HRT. But actually, the risk of stroke is is pretty small relative to the benefit of HRT for women in terms of bone health, and actually can have cardioprotective uh, benefits as well. And there is some research showing that, similar to in the Alzheimer's, there might be this critical window uh, of transition from perimenopause into menopause, where it may, in fact, uh, help to slow progression of. Uh, Parkinson's now the, the information the evidence is not strong enough to say for definite but I think regardless of that um, if I even backtrack in terms of women who are still having menstrual cycles you know if, if it's impacting sort of half of their month um, that their symptoms are off and there are um, women who have, have um, been given extra doses of their levodopa and that's really helped with calming their symptoms. Uh, and it's only for a short time, just around the window of their pre, uh, their, their menstrual bleed. Uh, and then other people have been put on hormone, you know, the pill or that to help them with their, their Parkinson's symptoms around their menstruation. And, but it's very ad hoc, not everybody's getting, you know, and obviously it needs to be tailored to an individual, but it's not even been discussed in terms of how we can help women actually uh, reduce their, their symptoms around the menstrual cycle today. And I think that's something that we should be we should be treated with uh, today. Uh, and then in terms of research, you know, really to, to raise our voices that women should, you know, this whole area of hormones and the effect and HRT uh, and hormone therapy and uh, should be looked at in terms of research for perhaps a way to slow the progression of Parkinson's. And it may have benefits to men and not just women. And it may not just be estrogen, it could be testosterone, progesterone. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole area there that really hasn't, been researched enough. Um, and you're probably familiar with Maria Shriver. She um, set up the women's uh, Alzheimer's movement and she's very much championing about trying to look at this whole area of hormones in relation to Alzheimer's disease um, that Roberta has mentioned about the, the critical window in, in Alzheimer's, et cetera. So um, yeah, so just want to say that in terms of the slides, we did two webinars um, with guest speakers and Roberta was on one of them. Um, we also I wrote a blog for the PD Avengers website. Uh, there's also a blog on the Women's Brain Project, which is an organization based in Switzerland that looks at different conditions uh, that you know, affect women's uh, brains. Um, and also there's the, obviously the Parkinson's uh, Foundation has a whole sort of uh, area around women and Parkinson's disease as well. Um, and I just want to give a shout out. These are the, the two teams of ladies that I moderated two webinars there, one with the Cure Parkinson's Trust and one with the PMD Alliance. Um, and I think many of us know Indu um, and also um, her name's gone out of my head, who's written the Parkinson's Diva. Um, oh, so Maria. Maria, thank you. So as you can see, a lot of uh, uh, women, you know, trying to voice our opinions with the Guardian. Obviously, I want to thank um, uh, uh, Oh, oh, brain. Sharon. Sharon, Sharon that's okay. Twitchy brain woman. There. Sharon for, you know, uh, taking part in one of the webinars and then immediately asked me to come along and, and you know, discuss it more with yourself. So I'm delighted to be here. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer with the others. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll stop the screen sharing and I'm going to change, unpin. All right. We've got everybody up. Okay. Um, so we have a number of questions in the chat. And I actually have a couple of questions before we start going to the chat. We have about 10 minutes to, to answer questions. Um, let's see, actually, no, I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna go to your questions. Uh, one, I think some of these have already been answered, but let's see, what can women do now who have Parkinson's uh, to help decrease any symptoms during during uh, during their menstrual cycle? Excuse me. 
I'm having my own issues here with my brain. Uh, no well, I think, as I, as I mentioned, I think the main thing women need to do is actually mention it to their neurologist, their GP, geriatrician, or well, more probably a geriatrician if it's around their menstrual cycle. But, um, you know, mention to your Parkinson's disease nurse that you're really struggling. Um, and they really have to look at that. And, and from our discussions on the webinars and on those webinars, which are definitely worth going back and, and watching, we had um, we had actually a, uh, a gynecologist who has young onset uh, Parkinson's herself. So it was really interesting her, hearing her insight. Uh, and obviously we had Maria, who's a, a neurologist who has Parkinson's disease as well, uh, as well as the experts um, on there. Uh, but the feeling was that and there's a Parkinson's disease specialist nurse, and she would certainly see that a number of her younger onset who were still menstruating, that they would uh, either use extra levodopa or use something like Madapar, which is kind of like a quick release uh, cinemat or levodopa to sort of help uh, improve their symptoms. And then in other cases, um, the gynecologist mentioned some women were put on, uh, you know, the pill or that uh, hormones to help with their symptoms. So it, it's sort of an individual approach, but it needs to be discussed and it needs to be trialed to see if it's gonna help women or not. So those things are there already and should be looked at. Um, one of the, um, Professor Elena Morrow, who is uh, you know, a big um, expert in, in neurology and movement disorders. And she sort of suggested that for some women, it might be, uh, the other thing is I mentioned about dyskinesia. So sometimes women with Parkinson's uh, suffer from dyskinesia more than men. And one of the reasons is that women tend to be of a lower body weight. And also we absorb levodopa much quicker than men. So we're titrated with the same dose, like I'll take it three times a day, uh, but it can have a much bigger impact on us. And if we absorb it quicker, it can worsen dyskinesia for some people. Um, so in her case, Elena, Professor Elena Morrow sort of said, you know, it might be for some women that they'd be better to reduce the levodopa and have more of an agonist. Obviously, that's taking into account that you don't suffer from um, impulse control disorders, which generally affect men more, but they can affect women as well. So there's definitely discussions that need to be had, uh, but women need to basically be a bit bolshy about pushing answers and getting them to to look into this a bit more would be my uh, answer to that question sorry if it went on a bit <laughs> oh, that's okay uh one more question uh does anyone have severe cramping as part of veg parkinson's symptoms well it wouldn't be surprised me if, if you could possibly could because basically um you know parkinson's because of lack of dopamine um in your in your brain because we lose the neurons um, and your, your, your dopamine affects all muscles in your body. So that's why it affects your, your um, speech, it affects your walk, it affects, um, you know, all sorts of different things. And, you know, for example, some people have vocal tremors, basically affects their voice box. Um, and some people have, you know, pelvic problems because it affects their muscles down there. And that's why the hips go as well. So it could very well be that it is a sign of, of um of Parkinson's, but again, it's something that you really need to, to um, discuss with, with your team and see if, if there's something they can, can do about that. It might be that a physio might be able to help with that as well in terms of relaxing muscles around that area, because I think it, it can happen for women. Okay, um, let's see. Um, how do you define early menopause and how long from last period is within your de definitions window of early menopause? Reverse to me. So um, average age of menopause is between 45 and 55 right now. Uh, that's how it's defined. And it should last an average of five years. That's what's called perimenopause. So anybody that experienced the symptoms of perimenopause before 45 is considered early menopause. Um, and then when you talk about, so menopause is defined as the one year where you have your last period. And then after that, it's, we start calling it post-menopause. I know it's a little bit like putting all things in boxes, but um, so the, the transition is called perimenopause. It's when you go through those approximately five years where you still have a period, but they are very irregular. And uh, also hormones can be fluctuated in a very odd way, which is not the usual way that they fluctuate during uh, 
normal period. So. And Roberta, could I jump in and just ask you a question on the back of, of that? So, you know, they talk about this critical window potentially yeah. uh, in Alzheimer's and in, in Parkinson's that, you know, in terms of HRT. So what yeah. would that critical window be? Would it be that five years or is it, you know, a little bit beyond, you know, because it's a kind of a bit of a movable. So they say, you know, a year since your last period is effectively you're in menopause. Does that mean it's too late? potentially take HRT in terms of having the benefit or is there any is there any classification of that critical window? Well the um first of all what the studies indicate is overall the best time would be during perimenopause to start taking it rather than in postmenopause. And then what they also indicate is that this window it's within those five years from when you have the menopause. Okay, not the transition. So you still have some room to. So the five you know, years after work. you start the menopause. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It seems like uh, it's still, it's still. That's the the time window. Yeah. Okay. But again, we're talking about we're extrapolating information from Alzheimer's, and we're talking about you know studies where they use different type of hormone therapies. But it seems that the 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 best time, if one were to decide to go on hormone therapies during perimenopause and few years after when the menopause starts. Yeah. All right. I want to thank all of you. And if you want to stay on for a few minutes afterwards, anybody wants to stay on and ask more questions, you're welcome to. Um, it's been very interesting. We learned a lot. There's a lot of questions out there and we have a lot of work to do, ladies. Uh, we do have to raise our voices. We have to be the ones who talk to the, tell the doctors we need this information um, and you know that they should be they should have it ready to give to uh, to give to us we shouldn't have to ask for it um, so I since I don't have my PowerPoint I can't show it I want to thank you all you all get a virtual tiara and a virtual hug from all of us and um, in two weeks we're actually going to have two programs uh, in July on different Parkinson's organizations. I've gotten a number of questions. People have emailed me, especially last December when everybody was being asked for lots of money from many different places. Who do I support and what do they do? There are a lot of Parkinson's organizations out there. So we have eight different representatives from eight different organizations speaking over two weeks. We have, and I may forget somebody, we have the American Parkinson's Disease Association, the European Parkinson's, Disease Association for those of you in Europe, Michael J. Fox, Parkinson's Foundation, PMD Alliance, Brian Grant, Davis Finney, and I'm missing somebody. <laughs> but they will, I'm um, trying to think, oh, and uh, PD Avengers. So we will have four speak on each of the two dates. So I hope you will join us. It will be an interesting day. Uh, you'll learn about who they are, what they do, because Frankly, there's not a lot of difference between some of them. And then others, some are patient oriented, some are research oriented, and we don't, nobody seems to know what anybody does. And there's a lot of overlap. So I hope you join us for those. You should um, ask them what they're and, doing for women, Sharon. And what they're doing for women, absolutely. Uh, we need you to come on and ask what they are doing for women specifically. Um, I know your Parkinson's Foundation, I've been working with them for the last six years on women's issues for Parkinson's. And um, I know they've, they've been at the forefront of this. I don't know what the other organizations are doing specifically for women, uh, but through the Parkinson's Foundation, we did, I was part of a major study they did. Um, and I was in a uh, training session that they, they had done prior to that um, and they've really taken the lead on this. So thank you for mentioning that. And of course there is the Parkinson's Women's Project. Maybe we should merge. Yeah, well I mean, we the whole be. idea of the Parkinson's Women's Project is um, is the Women's Parkinson's Project. It was really because we just wanted to elevate the voices of everyone who's doing work and so not to duplicate, but to actually, you know, um, to, to highlight you know, the likes of Twitchy Women and various things that are going on there so that we can all start, you know, shouting a bit louder. And it just comes to mind as well that maybe we should be saying to them, you know, how much of your, your research 
is in women, how much of your funding goes to female research. You know, maybe we need to be a little bit more, you know, pushy about it. You know, there's Roberta looking at, you know, some really interesting uh, you know, research, you know, and I know she mentioned on the webinar that she spoke on with me was that it's quite difficult to get research funding for Parkinson's and women and hormones. So um, we need someone like Maria Shriver in the PD world who has a bit of clout. So anyone know anyone? <laughs> yeah, we could use your connections. Uh, Kay, you have a question, unmute yourself. And this is the formal part of the program is over. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I know it's summer and you've got lots of other places to be now that you can be there. We went to the Dodger game yesterday and that was an experience. Um, but yeah, enjoy the rest of the summer. And we hope to see you in July for these two meetings. I wanna and thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much for inviting me and for putting together this, this great event. Thank oh, you so welcome. much. I'm so glad all of you could join us because it was great and three different, totally different perspectives. So thank you, Caitlin, Roberta and Rochelle.